So today I want to talk about a case where the patient's primary complaint was headaches. And I want to talk about this for two reasons. One is because headaches are a very frequent complaint that we hear in patients experience when they're coming here to the Kaiser Clinic. And two, because this is a great example of when we're looking at objective measures and subjective complaints, we're looking for improvements in both of those things when patients are here at the clinic, but the timeline of them isn't always the same. So this is a great example of when we saw awesome objective improvements here at the clinic, but the subjective improvements, so the patient's feeling of her symptoms, took longer to improve. And this is really common, so I want to talk a little bit more about that today. So the patient for this case is a 38-year-old female who presented with, at the time, about a year and a half of persistent headaches. So she was waking up with a headache, experience a headache all day long, and then going to sleep with a headache. They really never went away. Initially, when the headaches came on, she was tired, she had done some traveling, she'd gotten some bug bites that she'd had an initial reaction to, but that went away. She woke up with the headache and noticed that it persisted even when she drank more water, started stretching, and went to sleep. Over time, she noticed that the headache increased in intensity and duration to the point where she was experiencing it all day, every day, at a pretty high intensity and it was interfering with her ability to participate in the activities that she likes to do in her daily life. As it progressed, she also noticed that it started causing other symptoms. She was having a lot of back and neck pain. She also started to experience tachycardia or an increased heart rate when she would stand up or change positions. She started to notice that she was having an increased level of anxiety and depressive thoughts. She started to notice that she was having more panic attacks, it started to become difficult for her to fall and stay asleep. And she started experiencing that she was having exercise as well as heat intolerance. So initially it started with a headache and then it progressed to a lot of other symptoms as well. So when she came into the clinic, we wanted to look at finding what is the mechanism for this headache? What is causing her to have these headaches that are interfering with her life? So a headache is pretty a pretty general diagnosis. What we really wanna look at is exactly what is causing this and what can we do to help improve the headaches. So when the patient came in, we began with an exam. So we looked at a thorough neurological examination that included a review of the history, a physical examination, neurological and autonomic tests, as well as tests that checked the oculomotor system. So when we looked at this patient, I was able to break down the findings into three general areas. The first thing that was really noticeable for her was that she had a lot of sensory changes in her extremities. So when you used a pinwheel or a pinprick sensation in both her hands and in her feet, she had less ability to feel this. She also had less ability to detect cold sensation in her hands and her feet as well. So when we're looking at both of these different stimuli, that's telling us that the small fibers in her hands and her feet aren't working the way we're supposed to. This becomes important for her specifically because the small fibers are also what controls blood flow delivery to the extremities. And we're gonna see with some of the other tests is that that is an area that wasn't working too well for her either. So we were able to see that those were dysfunctional, but her sense of vibration was intact. We also noticed that she had changes in her skin. So on her forearms bilaterally, she had something that was called levito reticularis. This is like a net or lace-like patterning that you can see on the skin. And she had acrocyanosis in her feet, which is a bluish or white discoloration. Both of those tell us that the blood supply or the blood flow to this area isn't being delivered in the way we would want it to. So the second area we looked at was oculomotor changes. We noticed using bedside examination as well as using a VOG or video oculography that there were some areas where her eyes weren't functioning the way we want them to. So we noticed right off the bat that she had difficulties with vergence, so bringing her eyes in and out both symmetrically as well as smoothly wasn't clicking in quickly or working the way we want it to. So the second area we wanted to address was some findings with regards to her eyes. So we noticed that she had a sluggish pupillary response. When we did video oculography or VOG testing, we also noticed that she was having square wave jerks or little oscillations of her eyes when she looked to the left and to the right. A lot of her tests, she would start off when she was supposed to be looking straight ahead with something that we call a convergent spasm, where instead of looking straight ahead, her eyes would converge together, almost like she's going cross-eyed when she's not meaning to. The vergence responses, so her ability to follow a target in and out when it moves smoothly as well as it jumps, also wasn't working the way we're supposed to. So we saw that this was jerky and the eyes weren't working in a yoked fashion together. 
The third thing we looked at was the way her autonomic system was working. So we used a four-part autonomic test to look at this. The first part was a baseline where we're capturing the information. So we're looking at blood pressure, we're looking at heart rate, we're looking at blood flow to her head, and we're looking at capnography. So we capture this information while she's laying down. We then look at a minute of deep breathing. So what happens when she does five second inhales, five second exhales. We do a Valsalva, so a nice deep breath where she blows into a tube and sees what happened when we change the pressure in her thoracic cavity. And then the last part of this is a tilt. So for her, a couple of important things that we noticed was with the Valsalva maneuver, she had a latency in correcting for the blood flow change. So when she did her Valsalva, we want the, it to change and then return and come back to baseline. For her, this process took too long. We also saw that when she went up for her tilt, a couple things happened. First, her end tidal carbon dioxide, so how much carbon dioxide she breathes out during every breath, dropped. So she was hypocapnic. We also noticed that the blood flow to her head, so the amount of blood that we were measuring, traveling through the middle cerebral artery, we measure this using a transcranial Doppler, decreased. So she was hypoperfused when she was standing up or going to 70 degrees of tilt on the test. And this hypoperfusion was more noticeable on the left side of her head than on the right. This made sense because for this patient, her headaches were always localized to the top left side of her head. So we also saw, because the patient was having hypoperfusion and hypocapnia, we saw that she had compensatory tachycardia, which makes sense. When she stands up and you're having a decrease in blood flow to your head, your heart's going to do the one thing it knows how to do in order to try to keep blood flow there, which is increase your heart rate. So the tachycardia that she was experiencing makes sense based on the other findings of the tilt test. So once we did our examination, we started right in with treatment. The patient was here for a two-week time span and she would work in various sessions every day. So we started for this patient with addressing her sensory dysfunction. So if we think about the way the body works, we get sensory information in, it's processed by the brain, and we get a motor output out. So to address her sensory dysfunction, we started by using peripheral nerve stimulation. So we used a peripheral nerve stimulation device in her feet as well as in her arms. So we used a peroneal and tibial nerve in her feet and then a median and ulnar nerve in her arm. We also did some stimulation of the face, so we did a V2 distribution in front of her ear and then infraorbital here. So we're looking to increase the amount of activity that's getting sent up to the brain from the peripheral system to increase her ability to detect changes specifically with the pinwheel and the temperature in her extremities. We then progressed to doing complex movements. We did whole body rotation dysfunction by using a bead string where she would move her eyes step by step in and out to make the eye stronger in doing this motion. For her, we also started working on tilt oscillations. So she would start in a supine position laying down. We would slowly and at small increments bring her up closer and closer to being upright and we would do it at a level where she could tolerate it. So we would train doing say zero to five degrees oscillations and we could see by using the measurement tools that we have that she was able to keep the blood flow to her brain at zero to five. Once she got really good at that, we would go zero to 10 and we would just increase that degree of movement from down to up as she got stronger and stronger. She also took part in daily cardiovascular exercise. So we did this in a means where we knew we could start to raise the level of her end tidal carbon dioxide, so try to bring that up in a level that she could tolerate. So for her, this was a supine cycling exercise, so she would lay down and she would do the cycling where she was able to improve well, first her exercise intolerance and then also that level of hypocapnia, we were able to get rid of that by using the cycling as part of her treatment. So during treatment, we're very focused on trying to make and measure improvements in the objective findings that we have during the exam. So we're trying to make improvements in those measurable values so that we can track progress as we're going through. And the great thing for this patient is that she had great objective improvements throughout the course of treatment. So we were able to see that her sensitivity to pinwheel and temperature in her hands got a lot better. She had less skin changes, so less of that levito reticularis and acrocyanosis at the end of her two weeks of treatment. We did a repeated 
tilt table examination, we were able to find that when she went up to 70 degrees of tilt, she no longer was being hypoperfused. So she was actually able to maintain blood flow to her head and to her brain while she went up to that 70 degrees of tilt. We also noticed that when she was doing her exercises and on repeat VOG exams, she had less convergent spasms. So instead of her eyes coming together and being stuck together when they should be straight ahead, she was able to move them in and out when she wanted to, but also look straight ahead without them being converged. We also noticed that she was able to actually tolerate doing some exercise without making her headaches worse. So these were really great, objective, measurable improvements that we saw over the course of treatment. But when we think about subjectively what the patient was feeling, she didn't notice a huge change in her symptoms from the start of treatment to the end. So what she noticed is that she was still having daily headaches. They may have been a little less intense during the day and doing some of the exercises and activities weren't exacerbating them when they might have done that before treatment. So an important thing that we need to consider is that we're going to focus on making objective measurable improvements. And when we make those, we know that the subjective improvements will follow. But these improvements don't always function on the same timeline. So for her, she had pretty fast objective improvements that we were able to measure in the clinic, but the subjective improvements weren't all the way there yet when she left. So what we did is we put together an individualized care plan that was a continuation of the exercises that she did here at the clinic for when she went home. So she needed to keep on going with these exercises for a prolonged period of time to strengthen the neurological pathways that we started to make improvements in while she was here. And the great thing for this patient, she adhered to these exercises without issue. She was very consistent. She did them every day. She stuck to the plan and she was able to see as she did them for longer and longer periods of time, more and more of the subjective improvements followed along with the objective. So when we followed up with her three months later, her subjective improvements were way better. She was noticing way less symptoms because she had stuck with the plan and it just took longer for those ones to catch up. So three months after and consistently doing her exercises, she was no longer having headache every day. She was able to wake up maybe with mild headache, but then doing her exercises would cause it to come down. She was able to actually spend time doing things with her family. A huge thing that impacted her life was the anxiety and panic that was associated with the constant headaches as well as the tachycardia that was happening, way came down. So she was actually able to enjoy what she was doing every day instead of just being swallowed up by the pain and intensity of her headache. It's important for us to consider that while we want you to have these amazing results when you come into the clinic, we're really gonna focus on making objective improvements because we know that with that, the subjective ones or the symptoms will follow. It just might take a longer time.